thank you. Um, now, I would have asked you if there were, if there were any questions about uh, Ronen's lecture, but I won't. So I assume there haven't been. And today, what we will do uh, is talk just a little bit. Let me just bring my screen. OK, so uh, until now, uh, what you have seen let me just wait another another minute. Yeah. Until now, what we have seen is is uh, the fact that you can represent your data as as a graph. Okay. So assume that I have this uh, manifold, this surface that is uh, represented as as a, um, so. This is a surface that somebody is giving me, and in order to do some calculations, to compare it, to design a sleeve, to uh, uh, design a shirt for my uh, next bike ride, I would like to do some uh, computation on it. So the question that, that comes in mind is how should I represent this data? And the first thing that would come to mind is let's treat it as a graph, okay? So let's think about it as a graph. Uh, we have nodes that we would put on the, um, on the surface and we'll connect them as edges. And uh, then we'll take uh, the theory that you learned in the previous lectures by Ronan, by Professor Talmon, and you'll uh, probably do some, uh, compute some diffusion distances between points and you'll try to, or, or compute the Laplacian and then try to embed it uh, by looking at the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. And it will tell you something about a flat way of treating this surface. The question is how much of all of this is true and how careful do we need to be with these kind of assumptions. And what I will show you in this lecture is that these are really strong assumptions that you can rely on uh, when you do your analysis to shapes. And, and um, well, let's, let's give some examples, okay? So can I take any metric space uh, squared um, and, and treat it as a graph? I mean, would it be true that that somebody can just treat any data as a graph. And let's, for this, for this argument, let's think of the simplest example that one could think of. And this is trying to navigate from uh, on a piece of paper. So you have uh, a piece of a plane, okay? This, this would be zero, this would be one. And what we are trying to do, and this would be zero, this would be one. What we are trying to do is navigate from this point on the uh, left, lower left, to that point on the, on the upper right. So we know that the shortest path is probably something that goes like that. Okay, it would be the shortest path connecting these two points in the Euclidean setting. Let's assume that we talk about the Euclidean setting. Now let's put a graph on this uh, problem and let's, let's my graph uh, be given by putting horizontal and vertical lines. Okay, so these would be my edges and the vertices would be the nodes in this graph. Okay, so now uh, we just go back to our good old Dijkstra algorithm uh, that would tell us uh, what you need to do is start from the source. So this would be the source vertex. And then you expand the nearest neighbors. So these would be my nearest neighbors at which I'm computing the distance. So it would be assumed that uh, the length of an edge is always equal to H. So the distance here would be H. And then the distance here would be 2H. And the distance here would be 3H. And here it would be 1, which is 4H. So H. Uh, in this specific age would be 0 0.225. And then I continue my expansion. I mean, uh, the expansion in their extra sets the distance to be two here and the distance to be two here. It, here it would be three uh, H and same here. And what we see is that as we do our uh, expansion of a graph that is given by regularly sampling the data, is that as we get to this point, the distance would be to the end point. So this would be the destination point. What would be the distance here? Anyone has any idea? Two. Two, thank you, Boa. So the distance here would be equal to two. And let me give you, uh, and it wouldn't matter how you refine your, your data, your grid, I mean, how you refine your graph, the distance between the source and the destination while restricting ourselves to walk on a regular graph would always be equal to two. In fact, what we say is that the graph uh, induces a non-natural metric on our problem. In this specific case, the metric would be, 
how would the unit sphere of this metric that is imposed by, by this regular graph uh, look like? Anyone this has is L1. Exactly, this so this L1 would be the L1. So if, just to translate Cole's uh, uh, answer, so if I would plot the equal distance uh, set of points from the source point, so let's do it for one, okay? So the distance of this point from that point is one. Same goes for here because I folded and, and if I would uh, look at the set of all points whose distance from the source is equal to one, uh, let me just plot it with a different color, this would be the distance one uh, points from this source point. And if I would do it for the whole plane, it would be this kind of unit uh, disk and this kind of unit disk is nothing but by definition, uh, the unit disk of the L1 norm. So in this specific case, uh, imposing a graph on the problem restricted me to something which is not what I wanted. I wanted the L2 and I got the L1. Now, those of you who have some uh, intuition would tell me, look, uh, what you need to do is, is uh, something simple. Instead of just connecting each point to its four neighbors, connect it to its, uh, I don't know, eight neighbors. Okay, so assume that this is what I would do. If I do something like that, what I would have is approximated the, the unit uh, the unit disk, uh, which is what I would have expected to accurate distances at these points, okay? And then my distance would be this polygon. And again, no matter how much I would refine my, uh, my uh, grid, as long as I'm restricting myself to these kind of connections, I would never converge to the poor solution. So if, for example, you throw more and more edges to, into your problem, what you get at the end of the day is this kind of polygon, sorry, this kind of polygon as your, uh, as your final solution rather than getting a circle. And the question is, can we do better? Can we actually compute? Can we come up with a um, similar to the extra? And, and um, Ido will talk about the extra algorithm in, in the recitation. Can we uh, have this kind of uh, quasi-linear complexity. So we say quasi-linear when we have something like that. So if we have n uh, vertices, then the complexity of this algorithm, of this algorithm of computing the distances from each and every point from the source point to each and every point in the domain is quasi-linear. It's a very efficient algorithm. And the question is, can we actually get something that would at the end of the day would converge to our continuous, uh, to our continuous um, uh, circle as we refine the grid? And the answer is obviously yes, otherwise I wouldn't have asked this question. Okay, so this was one question. Now assume that I'm, that you are now equipped with, with this magical tool that would allow you to compute distances in an accurate manner. And again, in, in um, what uh, Professor Talmon showed you, there is the hidden assumption of having this nice property of having um, uh, the possibility to randomly sample your, your domain. Uh, otherwise, you would have this kind of metrication error as I just showed you. Now, assume that by some magic, I've provided you with the distances, uh, with the accurate distances between all points to all points, or at least something that looks like that. The question is, can we now uh, take these intergeodesic distances? So we have this D um, between all points to all points, let's call it DIJ. So the DIJ is, uh, is the exact distance between all point to all points. Okay, so I have something like that. Obviously from that I can extract something that looks like the uh, graph Laplacian, but assume that now I'm considering my gra graph as a click, okay? A click is a graph for which each node is connected to each node. And I know the exact distance between every I and every J in the graph, okay? So I have exactly uh, the distance in this graph. Can we take this graph and embed it into Rn? Okay, for n finite, but as large as I want. Can I do that? What do you think? Is it possible? Well, don't give me an answer yet. In a moment, I will ask for your answer, but let's do this, the following trick. Let's take a point, just a small point. Now, this is one point, and I'm asking you, can I embed it into Rn, any Rn? What do you think? All I have is the distance of this point for, for, uh, from itself, okay? What do you think? Can I do that? Any ideas? The answer is trivial. 
Okay, I can put it in R0. Okay, so if I have one point, I can put it at the point and there is nothing to it. It's a two, but now let's complicate things a little bit. Assume that I have two points, okay? And the only thing that I have about these two points is the distance between them, okay? I have D12, which is obviously equal to D1, uh, D21. Can I embed it into, so this was, this one I could embed in R0, okay? Can I embed the distance? Can I put two points? Embed is putting, is placing the shaken, is putting these two points in uh, R of any finite dimensions. Anyone has any idea? You can put two points on a line. Yeah, thank you. So according to was what I need to do is put the first point, say, at the origin, and put the second point here. I mean, I will just take a campus, mechuga and uh, draw the distance which is given to me. So this would be uh, D12 or D21, it's equal. And I put the first one, so this would be P1, and this would be P2, and voila, I could embed two points. So here I had one, here I had two. Two points I could embed in R1. What happens with, let's take another color, what's happened with three points? Now I have three points and I have a DIJ that satisfies the triangle inequality. Can I embed it into any R? What do you think? R2. R2, who said R2, Yuval? Yes. Yeah. So I assume that Yuval suggested R2, then obviously yes. So I put the first point here, the second point here with the same campus as I did before. And then with the campus, I'm just plotting the uh, distance of the third, third point. And this would be one, this wouldn't be two, this would be three. And in fact, three points can always be embedded in R2. And now my question is, can I embed N points without any error into R N minus one? What do you think? Can I use this construction in order to continue? project them onto a surface of uh, N minus one dimensions. Sorry, again? You can project the points into a hyperplane of n minus one. Again, dimension. remember that what I aim here is that the distances between all points should be exactly as what this somebody provided me with, okay? So I take these distances and this should be exactly D13. This would be exactly D, D, uh, D32. This would be exactly D12, etc., etc. So I'm trying to take a uh, interdistances matrix, uh, which could be any, and embed it into some finite dimensional Euclidean space. And my question is, can you actually do it, do it, do it for endpoints? I mean, can I use the same trick, the same construction that I've shown you before in order to uh, make this uh, magic happen? What do you think? I think due to the dimensionality, I mean, to my opinion, it, it won't be uh, an option. Because you have the, all the restrictions have to be kept as you had the fourth point with regard to others and then the fifth point with regard to others. So I'm not sure it's, it, it can, it always have, uh, gonna happen. Sometimes maybe yes, but not always. So yeah, I, yeah, I hope you don't have Corona, uh, but, but, um, but uh, in order to contradict this claim, you need to come up with a, with a negative example, okay? With an example, I mean, uh, what I'll suggest is there is some difficulty of uh, adding more points to the game. I mean, you can think of putting the three points here and then finding the third, uh, the fourth point there. But what Eyal is intuitively saying is that since now you have more, more now you have three restrictions rather than only two, then probably the campus trick would not, um, I mean, if we think about GPS, it would not apply anymore. And the question is, can you come up with an example where it would fail? So this is the question. So now I deliberately stopped at four points. Why? Because there are very simple examples that would prohibit uh, the embedding of four points uh, into, into, in fact, any finite dimensional space. So let's take four points. So now I have four points and let's take these four points that would go like that. So the distance between point one and point two would be one. The distance between point two to point three would be one sorry, would be one. And the distance between point uh, two to point four would be one. And this would be, and the distance between point one and point four would be two. So it would be a distance on a graph. So uh, D one, 
So this would be let me write. So this would be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0.4. And d12 is equal to one. Uh, d23 uh, is equal to one. Uh, d24 is equal to one. And uh, d14 is equal to two. Okay. So this would be, and obviously d34 uh, is equal to two. Okay. So if I just write the interdistances matrix. So if this would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, then obviously along the diagonal, I would get the zero. So the distance of each vertex to itself would be zero. The distance between one to two is one. The distance between two to three is one. The distance between two, um, between two to four, okay, two to four, would be, so obviously it would be symmetric, okay? The distance between uh, two to four would be equal to one. So two is equal to one everywhere, but, but this is important. And again, uh, since we are, the distance between one to four would be, uh, would be two, okay? So here I would have one, one, one. The distance between one to three is also two. Sure. One, two, three, yeah. Okay. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I, and I am, I almost filled the matrix. There is also four, two, three. Okay, so this would be two here. Okay, so this is how the matrix looks like. And the question is, can I embed it in, in R, in any Rn of finite n? So let's put one here, okay? Let's put two here along the line, doesn't really matter. Let's put three here. So since the triangle inequality is satisfied along one, two, and three, they need to be on a straight line, okay? Otherwise, in any Rn that I put them, um, I cannot, I mean, I, they, 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 they cannot uh, be uh, uh, a different way of plot putting them there, okay? And now let's put, one, two, and four. So I put one here, I put four, two there, and four should be exactly at the same point as point three. And this would be a contradiction. I mean, I cannot, no matter how large I pick my end to be, I would never be able to embed such a configuration into, uh, into Euclidean space. So some of you would tell me, look, this is not a big uh, issue. I mean, you uh, here you deal with graphs, and graphs are not geometric objects. Uh, the interest of Ronnie Kimmel is just geometric objects, usually the two-dimensional smooth manifolds. Uh, let's restrict ourselves to only two-dimensional uh, um, uh, smooth manifold. Okay, so let's do that. So let's take the simplest example that I can think of a two-dimensional uh, surface, which is smooth. Let's think about the sphere. Okay, so I have a, three, a sphere, uh, the, the, the earth embedded, it's, let me try to do it a little bit nicer. So I have the sphere embedded in R3. So this would be the equator, and this is the North Pole, and this is the South Pole. Okay, and this is the this is this is the uh, this is where Israel is, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And now I'm asking the following question. Let's uh, suggest the following uh, four points on a sphere: the North Pole, the South Pole one point in the, in the equator and another point exactly at the other uh, side of the equator. Now, what is the uh, minimal geodesic, the shortest path connecting point one to point two to point three? It would be nothing but the great circle, half of the great circle going through these three points. But what is the uh, minimal geodesic connecting point one to point two to point three? It would also be the great, circle, part of the great circle, connecting point one to point two, and then to point three. What is the minimal path connecting point uh, two to point, this one was four. It would be nothing but the minimal geodesic connecting the two. Now, if I'm trying to embed these four points into any R finite N, okay? What I would do is put point one, point two, and point three, sorry, on a straight line, okay? So this would be point one, point two, and point three. Now, what happens with point one, point four, and point three? The same. 
they should also be on the straight line. But we know that the distance between point two and point four is uh, half the uh, perimeter of this uh, of, of the equator. So we are again uh, in contradiction. So it would never work. So in fact, embedding into Rn uh, when you have curved domain curved domains is can be a problem. So you should always be really, really careful with what you're doing. So we learn about the difficulties. Now let's move on to what we, can we do in order to, um, uh, to solve these fundamental difficulties um, uh, of trying to look at data, especially geometric data, and use Euclidean spaces in order to understand it, in order to solve it, in order to say that, look, I put my information on a, on a Cartesian regular grid, and now I can do stuff. Okay, so the question hey, is- Oni? Yeah, uh, sure. question. How do you define curved space? A curved space is any space for which um, uh, GIJ is not uh, diagonal, is something, okay, a curved domain, let's do it formally, is something that can be embedded into Rn, okay? This is flat space. In a moment, what we will see is that looking at the DIJs, I can decipher whether this is flat or not. And in fact, I can also decipher in how many dimensions I can embed it, okay? Can it be embedded into any Rn, okay? So just observing, looking at this matrix, I can immediately tell you whether this is flat or not, okay? So flat domains are those that can be embedded into Euclidean ones. More questions? So basically what you're saying that uh, the geometric uh, matrix is a full rank matrix? I don't know uh, what you're referring to as full rank matrix. Oh, this one? Yes. No, no, uh, uh, no not, the, not, the, not this one, the other one on the previous slide. Uh, which one, which one? Oh, I deleted everything, sorry. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I can do redo, no, it cannot do redo. Um, so, this one, if, if you're referring, in fact, this is this is the same matrix. I didn't. Um, so it, it, if it has full rank, it's not it's not uh, sufficient. In a moment, we'll see exactly how to look at this matrix and and say whether it is embeddable in in Rn or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it has it has little. It has something to do with the rank of the matrix, but it's not necessarily. Um, I mean, it can have a full rank, but still not be embeddable in in a, in a in a, in, a, in a Euclidean space, but rather in a complex space. And, and you can do magic with that, uh, which is something that uh, Gil Shamai did, uh, one of my PhD students, embedding into complex domains. And um, I will not have time to go through that in the course. And I do encourage you to look at, uh, at uh, Gil's embedding into complex spaces uh, trick. OK. So first of all, let's compute distances. How can I compute a distance? So let's think about the simplest example that you can think of a straight line. So this would be t or x, let's call it x here. And I know that at this point, at this specific point, my distance is equal to zero. And I denote t at uh, x zero, this would be x zero to be equal to zero. How can I characterize, how can I define a distance? I know that at x, uh, the distance from x zero would be x minus x zero. Okay, and I know that at this point, it would be x two minus x zero, et cetera, et cetera. And what I know is that if I look at the slope of this function, the slope is equal to one almost everywhere, okay? And the same goes to the other direction. So this, this is by definition a distance function in one dimension. And in fact, in any dimension, when I depart from my source, plot, from my source point at uh, equal rate, the gradient of the function would always be equal to one, okay? Sorry, come on. And now the question is how can I knowing this property. So this is a property of a distance function. So this is a property of a distance function. Dx uh, is equals the absolute value of dx is equal to one almost everywhere, okay? And the question is, can I design a numerical solver that would get this equation and would provide with this restriction and would provide the, uh, uh, the desired solution to me? Now, usually in the long version of the course, I go through something which is called viscosity solution and how you to solve uh, numerically differential equations, et cetera, et cetera. Here, I would jump 
over this uh, interesting uh, and fascinating field. And I will just tell you that, yes, there is. And the trick to do that goes as follows. Um, now, obviously, um, if I have, let me just show you this example because it's important. If I have two points at which I know that the distance is equal to zero, so this would be x0, x1, and this, sorry, this would be x0, and this would be x1. The distance from x1 would be this guy. The distance from x0 would be this guy. And I can talk about the distance from the two points, which would just be the lower envelope uh, of these two functions. Uh, because in this case, I'm asking the question for each and every point, uh, which point is closest to you, and then what is the distance from you, okay? And you can see that, again, uh, the distance function satisfies uh, the same equation, except of a very specific point, and this is, and this, is uh, this point here in the middle, okay? So the point in the middle is something that I need to take care of, and uh, this is how the solution would look like if I can compute uh, a solution. And in your, your homework, you had to, uh, uh, or you will have to, or you had to compute the distance function from source points using an algorithm that looks like that. Okay, so the question is how can I approximate this kind of uh, differential equation, this property, this local property, and uh, use it to compute distances on more complicated domains? And the answer is actually quite simple. When there is a will, there is a way. Um, this application, I, I updated it yesterday, and now you can see the result. So if, for example, I would have uh, approximated uh, in a straightforward manner the derivative, so if I would take the, the derivative and approximate it uh, using something which is called backward approximation. So if this would be my, uh, if, if given a, sum, a function, and if I sample it, uh, regularly at equally distant points, then I can consider the value here to be t at point i, and the value here to be at point here to be i minus one, and here to be i plus one. And now an approximation of, uh, of a derivative would be nothing but taking uh, the value at that point minus the value at that point, and then I would require that the uh, backward uh, approximation of the derivative would be equal to one. Now, if you do that, what you get is that uh, a solution to the distance function could be the right solution. But at the same token, you could actually uh, have a different solution, which would be, for example, this one. Okay, So you can have this one as, as the same valid or invalid solution, and the same would go to here. Okay, So if these were, were my points, you can change direction at each and every point, and the same, uh, the same validation for tx uh, equals one should be valid for both the red as well as the purple uh, curves, okay? And the question is, can I have another way of approximating the derivative that would give me the right solution? And the answer is yes. There is a way of uh, defining something which is called upwind switch, okay? And the approximation looks like that. Let me just give you an intuition it's also, it has some fancy names. It's a viscosity solver, Gudonov type method, etc. But for our sake, it has a very simple and intuitive manner that goes like that. Remember that you need to look for the absolute value of the gradient. So what you can do is uh, look for the maximum between the backwards approximation and minus the forward approximation. And this is how you can approximate the, uh, uh, the value of the gradient of the function at the point, okay? Why is it, it has fancy names, it's called upwind and uh, whatever, but the, the interesting thing is from the point of view of a point in the grid, so now assume that this is your x zero, this is where the number zero is, and this is xj. And now you are, or xi, okay, and now you are at position i and you can look up and you need, and you need to look at your neighbors, so this would be i minus one, and i plus one. And you need to define uh, how would you change your value so that the gradient of the resulting function at the end of the day would be equal to one. Now, you know that the information can propagate either from the left or from the right. And you, ne you need to look at only these points in order to define uh, what would be your own value. And the idea is that no matter uh, which value the right 
or the left hem, what you would do is change your own value so that the distance between you and the uh, left or right value would be one. And you pick the smallest one. Why do you pick the smallest one? Because the smallest one will tell you that I am closest to a source point, okay? I'm closest to the, my X zero point, okay? So this is a legitimate numerical approximation of a, an absolute value of a derivative. And if you use this kind of approximation, you would get, uh, and this is a strong, uh, this is a strong claim, you would get the distance function, okay? So mm -hmm. what you do is first of all, assign infinity to all points. And now you start scanning your domain so as, uh, to, so as to satisfy this equation almost everywhere. Now, was, it, was I clear or uh, should I give yeah. you? I have a question. Sure. Can, you re can you repeat the definition of Tx? And so, yeah. and the motivation so for, for? So Tx is nothing but a distance function. This was, let me go here. Tx is something that measured the distance from a source point. So at each point, at each value here, I would like T to be the, the value uh, of traveling back to X zero, okay? And, and why, we, why you draw it like a raise and not in, in oh, this is, angle? This is, this is the, uh, the uh, T value or, okay, this is the distance function and this is the X. Okay. I have a one dimensional problem, okay? I have a point here. This is a one dimensional problem. And now I'm asking what is the question that for each and every point here would assign a value of the distance of the point from the source. Okay. So I'm aligning myself, okay, this is a virtual axis. Uh, if the value of this function is T, assume, look at my hands, assume that now I'm rotating my, uh, my space and I'm looking, I'm plotting the values of T. So when I'm a distance like that from the source point, this would be my value. If, if I'm uh, at this point, this would be my value, okay? Let's, let's think of a different example. Let's think of a plane, okay? And now I have a point here. This would be my x zero, or x, y zero, okay? How would the distance function, how would the t, the t of x and y from this x zero, y zero look like? Like a circle in the radius t. Or How would it look like when I try to look at it in the, uh, huh. in the function space, in the x, y, t space? Like a cone. A cone. Okay, Yuval Friedman, yeah? A cone. It would look like a cone. So the extension of my rays is nothing but a cone. Now you can think of how it would look like in 3D. So in 3D now, I have a point and I would like to plot my distance function from this point. And in 3D, it would be, uh, you can think of uh, consecutive spheres that are embedded one within the other. And, and it's, a, it's a generalization of the notion of the cone, okay? But the gradient in all cases, the gradient of the, uh, the slope of this cone and the slope of this function and the slope, uh, the gradient uh, of this T in 3D would always be equal to one. Why? Because think about it like the Big Bang, okay? Since that I'm propagating with a constant speed because the distance from the source point is always how much time it took me to get to a point. Yeah, did I answer your question? So you, you constrain the t to equal, to equal one, the derivative of t to be equal to I'm one? I'm saying that this is equivalent. If I'm doing it right, this would be equivalent to computing distances. Okay, so if I can solve this equation, I will be able to compute distances. This is my claim. Okay. Now I need to prove the claim and I'm now hand waving my, my uh, claim only for one D. I'm telling you, look, uh, I can do, I can satisfy this claim only if you allow me to use this crazy kind of update scheme, okay? If you implement this update scheme in a computer, I can, I can do that. Let me, let me uh, uh, change into a different uh, presentation in which I, I worked hard in order to, um, uh, do some, let me do that, come on. My computer is working too hard on that. Well, can you maybe explain what are those TIs? I think I missed like the, you took these TIs and you applied some kind of uh, update on them, but uh, from where do they come? I'm not sure I understood your, uh, the setting. Sure, sure. So 
let's uh, let's let let's x be my uh, my values. Okay, my my domain on which I am exploring uh, my distance. I would like to compute the distance, and t x is my distance function. Okay, this is in the continuous setting. Okay. Now. The, as I told you, the definition of a distance function is x minus x zero, and everybody is happy. Now we also notice that the gradient should be equal to one, except at the source point. Okay, this is this is something that I explained. Now, if I have two points, uh, same goes. Uh, I have the lower envelope as my distance function, and again the same property: the distance function gradient is equal to one almost everywhere. There are three points at which this condition is violated. But these two points are the source points, so I don't really care about them. This point that I will need to take care of. Okay, now all these functions are actually um, having a gradient one almost everywhere. But look, this function is less smooth than the green function, the function that I'm looking for. What we are saying is that we are looking at the end of the day for the smoothest possible solution which is called the viscosity solution that would satisfy this equation, okay? So if some magician is giving you a numerical scheme to solve this equation that would give you the green graph, the green function rather than the red function, then you would be happy, okay? As I told you, now I'm sampling my x-axis, okay? I'm sampling it with equally distance point. So this would be uh, x0, this would be... Uh, I, I picked that. So this would be one, this would be two, this would be three, this would be four, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm naming them ti. So the value of t at this point would be t0. The value of, uh, of t at this point would be t1, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I would choose a naive way of approximating the gradient, which is nothing but subtracting the value of t at one point from the value of t at the other point, then what I would get is really bad solution. I mean, all of these solutions, the red, the blue, and the green would be as valid as the green that I'm looking for. So now I need to invent a trick, okay? And this is my trick. I'm telling you that this magical way of looking at the maximum between the backwards minus the forward and zero would give you the desired solution. Why? In this course, I would not get into it. But in a moment, I will give you the, the intuition, OK? So if I'm looking at, at this equation and I'm plugging this equation into what is going on here at the top, then what is going on here at the top, let me see if I can, um, in a moment, I will, I will move into, uh, into my, um, let me just say, um, uh, that I cannot answer. One. Yep. Um, if you if you if you solve a sparse least worse uh, equation using this this is a, as your, your your regularization condition with very low lambda, this is exactly what you're gonna get right because you're gonna I mean you use these points that you want to go through this uh, on the on this on this line um, with so, sparse matrix and let, let me translate what you're saying you're saying that let's uh, solve a least square problem where um, something like that is my restriction, yeah? No, no, this is your, this would be your regular, regularization condition with very low lambda. Then you're gonna, the, the, oh, the, okay, okay. So the what solution, the, the least was is, is, is saying is let's, points. let's say some epsilon times uh, the, the gradient squared of the function and let's try to solve it iteratively. The answer is yes, you would be able, able to exactly solve this one. The question is, what would be the computational effort of solving such a question? In fact, you are absolutely right. The viscosity solution is, in fact, coming from the idea of adding some regularity to the problem and taking it to the limit. There are two questions. What would be the final accuracy and how fast can you get to the solution? And I would like something that would be uh, quasi-linear at worst. I mean, I would like it to be linear and even less than linear. I will show you that you can achieve that. And the question is, how can you do that? And I'm telling you, look, even if you even if you try to regularize this kind of equation, it would not give you the final solution properly because uh, you can, I mean, you really need to prove that your solver is convex in order to pick the green uh, solution from the rest of them. And it would not be such an easy task. Okay, so let's do the other trick. Let's use my magical update scheme uh, that I've given you here. 
In fact, if you will uh, look at what is, I mean, asking uh, this approximation to be equal to one, uh, and now think that you are at, pos at point I, and you look at your left and right neighbors, and you would like to update your own value. What you basically need to, need to know is look at the minimum between the left and the right, okay? And pick the smallest of them. And among the, the smallest, uh, you would uh, update yourself. I mean, if at the end of the day, look, look at what is going on here. I mean, let me just shift back to my slides. I mean, let me stop share here and start sharing there. Let's see how fast I can move between the two. Okay, whoa, it completely messes up with my screen, come on. Okay, um, in a moment we'll go back to the slide. So if we'll go back to what is written here, in fact, I can write it as what you see over here. I can write it as max between, I mean, I can uh, take the, uh, the one over H outside of the uh, max operator because it would be the same uh, the same distance between uh, between points. And what I can do is write it as such explicitly. Okay, I have ti minus ti minus one, one and ti minus ti plus one. And if I'm looking for the maximum of them, then I can uh, pick the minimum of these two values because I'm looking for the maximum and, and write it as follows, okay? Okay, so this is uh, uh, this one would lead to this uh, to this uh, realization. So now, when I'm trying to implement my uh, update scheme numerically, what happens is that I have um, um, assume that I have two points at which I know that the the, the distance is zero. In, so I would okay. So now I'm at point i. Okay, and my value, let's assume for a mo moment, is infinity. I'm looking, so this is T at point, at point I. And I'm looking at my left neighbor, T I minus one, and this would be its value. And I'm looking at my right neighbors, this would be I plus one, so this would be T I minus one. And this would be T I plus one, so this would be the value here, so this is T I plus one. And my claim is that if you adopt the, uh, the update scheme that I've shown you before, you need to take the minimum of these two, which would be ti minus one in this case, okay? So I'm taking ti minus one, and I'm adjusting my own value to ti minus one plus h, okay? Because the distance, and this would be my value. So t at point i after this update would be ti minus one plus h, okay? Now, if my own value would have been lower, then I would not have done anything. I mean, I'm doing it only for the case where uh, my value is really at infinity. Okay. Um, now it is called upwind because what is going on is that the left point is saying, look, the source point is somewhere there and the right point is somewhere there. So you need to know where the wind is blowing and the, the wind is blowing from the nearest source. And this is why the numerical analysis people name this update scheme and up, an upwind scheme, but this is not really important. The importance is that there is a way of updating my a numerical update that would, that would uh, give me the benefit of uh, computing the right distance, okay? So now the question is, uh, I've given you an algorithm. Okay, this is an algorithm of how to update your points. You look at the, this is your grid. You look at the left neighbor, you look at the right neighbor, and according to their values, you are updating your own. And the question is, how do I scan my grid? I mean, how do I, uh, how do I choose uh, the right order of selecting the points? Okay, now any ideas? How should I do it efficiently? Can you repeat the question, please? Again? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I have all of my points at which I know that the value is equal to infinity. And I have a source point somewhere here. This is point T0, T at point X0. And I know that the value at this point is equal to zero. It's grounded, okay? Now I'm using this update scheme in order to compute 
the distance at the rest of the domain. And if I apply this update scheme enough times at the end of the do domain, at the end of the day, what I would have is a slope which is equal to one to this direction and slope that is equal to one to that direction. The question is what would be the order of visiting? So if I have MATLAB, for example, I would do it to all points at once. And after a while, I would get my, uh, my uh, V-shape, I would get my cone, I would get my spheres, everybody would be really happy. But now I don't have a MATLAB. I'm an Intel employee and I would like to have a sequential computer that is running this problem. How can I solve it really, really, really efficiently? I would like ideas. This could be bad ideas. I mean, I would like to have any idea. Efrat, the problem is, is clear. I'm not talking about the solution. I'm talking yes, about- Yes, yes, uh, it was a really good explanation, thanks. So, so I would like to have, uh, so let me give you hints. Uh, we talked about graph search, okay? How would you apply graph search here? This is the source, okay? This is the source point. What happens with the graph search? In a graph search, the first neighbor is updated by the, by the, by the, by the source, okay? And then the second uh, uh, points are updated, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, if I would apply graph search, and this is a very simple graph, I mean, this graph is nothing but edges connecting these nodes. So if I would apply graph search in this specific case, what I would get is order of n uh, log n algorithm. This is the famous the extra algorithm, and this is a quasi-linear uh, algorithm and in fact this is a very powerful one and when we'll uh, extend our problem to higher domains this is this would be the algorithm of choice but but in 1d there is a much simpler way of solving the problem let me uh, now uh, scan so remember this point is grounded so here i have a point which is equal to zero the rest are at infinity okay so here i have infinity 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 and what happens if I now just update that point, okay? If I, if I would update only that point. If I update that point, I know exactly what is the distance. And now assume that I would update that point. If I update that point, I know exactly what is the distance, et cetera, et cetera. So if I do scanning from left to right, what happens is that I would update all the right going slopes uh, in a correct way, but all the points at this direction would not be updated. Okay, only that point was updated. That one was uh, was not updated correctly, and that point was not corrected uh, uh, was not updated correctly. Now assume that I continue another iteration left to right. What happens now is that this point would be updated, and in fact, what I would ne need at the end of the day is order of n squared scans. I would I would need at least n squares in order to propagate all the information from the zero to the left. So obviously what you would, what uh, any uh, sensible person would tell me, look, first of all, scan right to left, then left to right, I mean the opposite. And two scans would be enough in order to solve the problem. And this is indeed, so order of N algorithm is indeed what is known as the Danielson algorithm. In fact, there is an extension to this algorithm to 2D domains. In two, in two dimensional domains, you need to scan left to right uh, top to bottom, top, top to bottom. So you do you do raster scan like that. Then you do raster scan like that, and then you switch the uh, scanning directions up right left. Uh, uh, sorry, up down left right. And four scans are in fact in, uh, enough uh, to solve the problem for for uh, for two dimensional domains. In four dimensional in three dimensional domains, you'll have eight, etc., etc. Two, two to the power of the dimensions that you need. And this is called the Daniel Danielson algorithm. It computes the distance almost accurately because if we think about uh, there are some pathological cases that, which I will not touch in this course, but uh, you can fix them. So we have three types of algorithm. One of them is called sorry, it's not yeah. One of them is called the Daniels algorithm, which is linear. Another one, uh, which is naive, always scanning left to right, which is, which is stupid, and therefore I would not talk about it. And the third one, which is a graph-based algorithm, which by now you should be familiar with, this is the good old diextra algorithm. Uh, you uh, modify the source point, the source point looks at its neighbors, 
the shortest neighbor updates its neighbors, then the shortest neighbor updates its neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And this is how would you compute, how you would compute distances. Now, before I go into weighted domains, I would like, and before before we get into uh, uh, into into a break, let me just show you some slides. Um, so, Ron, a small question about uh, the update order slide uh, before. Okay. Um, is it true to say that uh, um, if you want to save computational effort, it the best way to do is to to run twice option three? Let's go into option three. So option three was the diextra algorithm. Okay, so yes. you start from the source. Then Here, again. Because, because you have to choose the point, the next point to update, it would cost you the uh, ordering of the heap. I don't know if you remember, but in a diextra algorithm, you keep an order list and the order list uh, costs you log n every time you touch it. Okay? Yes, but it's so still it, twice, twice log n is still better than, than uh, n square. So, it, yeah, so it, the, first, the first one is something that we dismissed Im immediately. So this was the first one. Obviously, it would be a really bad uh, solution to our problem. I would not, I would never do that. So the two competitors I have now are left to right, right to left, and uh, graph search. Okay. These are the two competitors that I would consider. Okay. okay? So right to left, left to right uh, would be the uh, optimal solution between these two. So it would be only uh, this would this guy would be only uh, uh, order of n, and this guy would be n log n. Obviously, two n is n. Okay, so if, if this was your question, then yes, log n is always greater than two, then this would be really, um, really, uh, really cheaper. In 2D, uh, you can do it in, on a parallel machine using uh, only the width. In fact, uh, there are really nice examples that would show how to, um, probably when we go to the uh, break, I would show you how to compute it on manifolds uh, with a really efficient method. In fact, it was the first uh, GP GPU uh, algorithm that did, um, um, uh, geometry processing on, on a GPU. It's due to another professor in your department, Alex Bronstein and some others, and Michael Bronstein and some others. Um, so this is uh, yet another way of computing distances. Now, um, I think that now we are ready for a break, but before that, let me see if I can uh, dig my... Um, uh, I mean, let's, let's take a break and I would uh, show the... Um, I will try to upload the um, example of how to run this kind of a distance function on surfaces. So if you have any question, uh, let's uh, do, that, do that now. Otherwise, let's take 10 minute break. Imagine a world where Voronoi diagrams are computed in the blink of an eye. Twelve years after the fast marching, the computation of geophysics will never be the same. So this guy was uh, 12 years ago. You can just imagine how fast you can do that today.
אוקיי. אוקיי, so I'm back. Now, enough, enough. Uh, I also got a, a note that's saying that it's enough with the numerics. Um, now, the next question that comes in mind is what happens when we have, um, are you with me? Yep, is what happens when I have a weighted domain. So assume that somebody is giving me um, a domain and now uh, there is also a penalty. Okay, there is this penalty function. This is a function. Let me do it like that. Uh, this would be my T function. And here I have uh, a, a, an F function that defines how costly it would be to uh, walk in this domain and then how costly it would be walking in that domain. Uh, you would have an exercise like that with the, uh, with the um, uh, FOMA principle, okay? Now the question is how should the gradient of the function look like uh, when the domain is weighted by this f function. Now remember that the distance gradient is equal to one almost everywhere, okay? So what we do now is we plug, we take a derivative uh, of t with respect to b, to v. Now we use the chain rule in order to uh, get this equation. We know that this one is equal to one, okay? And at the end of the day, we get that uh, dx over dv, okay, is equal to nothing but one over f here. Okay, so we know that uh, what we get is that the gradient of my distance function is proportional to the cost. So it means that if I start from, if I start from this point here, if, if this would have been my zero, so as long as I'm walking, at region where the cost is low, uh, I, can, I can walk like that, okay? So getting from this point to that point, I had to pay a little bit of, co a little bit of um, cost. But if I continue my travel, then the gradient would be exactly proportional to F, okay? So instead of just having this cone function, this V function, now I would have something that looks uh, whose slope, okay? So this is T of X, now is equal to F. But from a numerical point of view, nothing is changing. I mean, I can use exactly the same numerical scheme. And uh, the magic is that uh, the previous construction was also true for moving uh, from uh, one dimension to two dimensions. So now I have a, an isotropic cost function. It's very important to say that this is uh, uh, isotropic inhomogeneous. I mean, it can change in space. So isotropic means that it uh, penalizes to all directions in a, in a similar manner, okay? But as you move from point to point, it has different values. And Ido in the recitation would show you that this is in fact how you would compute uh, the, the Snell or the Fresnel uh, uh, the, the equation, okay? So in this case, again, the slope of my generalized cone should be exactly uh, proportional to the, uh, to the cost function, okay? And this is by definition, what is the square uh, of a gradient. So not much is said here. Um, Ron, in, is it uh, dx squared plus dy squared or is it dxy times dx, uh, sorry, dx times dy? Again, 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 what was the question? This was- the area element there, uh, the equation for dv squared. So do we want, yes, do we want dx squared plus dy squared or do we want the uh, uh, the product dx dy? No, 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 in the in the Euclidean space, remember dx squared is uh, dy squared plus, D, uh, plus uh, dx squared. This is, this, is, this is the definition of uh, Euclidean distance. Ah, this is the square distance, okay. Yeah, this is the definition of a square distance. All I did, is added my regular distance a penalty, okay? So this would be a penalty. This is the penalty. And what I'm saying is that at the end of the day, the gradient of the distance function you're looking for is exactly, should be exactly equivalent to the penalty. Traversability, uh, penalty, call it ho however you like to call it, okay? So now the question is how to implement it and, and uh, 
there is not much of a, um, uh, there is not much of a surprise to say that this is exactly the same numerical approximation as before. In a moment, I will uh, I will uh, tell you how. But let me um, before that let me actually okay. Let me uh, uh, relate this idea to um, uh, to the continuous case and tell you that when you are minimizing, okay, what we are, we are looking at the end of the day is minimizing this kind of a cost, okay? We'd like to start from a source point uh, and at the destination point, and we'd like to compute the distance function. Uh, these are the levels of the distance function that would allow us to, uh, to reach this point in the shortest possible way, okay? It is obvious then that if I've computed this T of X and Y, there should be a way uh, of, back tracking my trace back to the origin and this back tracking of the trace would be nothing but the how do you call it let me show you an example of how it would look in the when f is equal to one this would be concentric circle and here if i just propagate along the gradient direction it would be this guy how do we call the uh, shortest line connecting two points geodesic, okay? And the shortest one would be a minimal geodesic. So if I have my T, okay, uh, of X and Y, I could extract back the minimal geodesic by solving uh, a gradient descent uh, procedure. I'm just looking at the gradient at each and every point of, 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 uh, in my plane, and I'm backtracking my trace. And this is how I can integrate back the minimal geodesic of this of this uh, of this curve. Okay, so again, computing t, I can backtrace uh, my minimal path. Now, so minimizing the integration over the cost is what is uh, is leading me to that kind of equation. But you already minimize this kind of a cost, and you got to this one as the Euler Lagrange equation. So, if somebody would have given you two points, and you and then an, an initial curve connecting these two points and you would have had to uh, propagate it somehow so that it would minimize its length into a minimum into a geodesic then what you would do is probably change your curve so that uh, it would do something like that i don't know in the normal direction okay so it would shrink itself so this is a local way of shrinking a curve so that it would eventually converge into the local uh, geodesic and the, the idea of computing, first of all, the distance and then propagating backwards is optimizing the same measure, but in a global way, okay? So this would give you the global minimum of connecting this point to that point. What you can do with this kind of equation is start from a curve without any constraints on the boundaries and let it evolve so that eventually it would snap into the minimal uh, geodesic. And this minimal geodesic would have semantic meanings. It could be the boundary of an object, uh, the boundary of an object in 3D, in 4D, et cetera, et cetera. So it has some interesting uh, properties. But what you need to prove is that indeed, this kind of equation would give you this kind of condition, that there is indeed equivalence between these two uh, kind of, uh, of uh, settings of the same problem. Now, this is not a big deal. We can show it in three lines. In fact, he did it in uh, details in his uh, recitation. Uh, but, but what you could figure is that, um, is that many people thought about it. In fact, it's called the Bellman. I think it was the first to actually uh, realize that it, it would be uh, written in a completely different settings, but uh, the Bellman equality is something that, uh, that is related to that. Okay, how would you prove it? Um, uh, if, if I backtrace along my computer distance function uh, curve, um, uh, where I know that the gradient, the absolute value of the gradient is equal to, is equal to, my, um, uh, to my penalty function, then what I need to show is that, uh, let me just move back. So again, these are the level sets of my T function. This is the source point. Uh, this is the gradient. Okay, so this is the gradient of T. And I know that my curve, my backtracking curve, CT is equal to minus gradient of T. So I know that the tangent of this curve would be the normalized part. 
So I can, I know exactly how the, since I have the tangent, I know exactly how the curvature vector would look like. It would be the second derivative according to Appen. And what, what, now what you do is you just work your way here. Uh, this is uh, the chain reaction, uh, the chain reaction, the chain rule uh, operating on the components of this, uh, of this equation. And at the end of the day, what you get is exactly the order of branch that you would have received uh, for looking at this kind of equation, okay? And again, uh, Ido uh, would clarify things for you uh, about this connection. Okay, so in 2D, I promised you that the update scheme would look really, really similar to the uh, one-dimensional case, but now you have to do it for the X and the Y. And uh, numerically, what you do is you go for the left and the right and the, and the top and the bottom, and you select, select the, the smallest one. And in this case, uh, you end up uh, solving a quadratic equation that looks like that, okay? Now I'm debating whether to move back to the slides. Let me just try to move back to the slides and see how uh, it goes. Now I learned to do it in a fast way. Okay. So what you see over here is a penalty function and you have x0 and x1 at which I have the t which is equal to zero. And then when I'm computing my, uh, my weight at distance, the gradient should be, this is a sketch, should be inversely, should be proportional to the cost, okay? Um, in 2D, this is the update, this is the update scheme that I'm- So ending. Ron, well, what is this uh, weight? Uh, sorry for interrupting. What is this uh, weight function? I mean, in, in uh, one dimension, I thought of it as uh, the parameterization uh, freedom. Uh, no, 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 no. This is something that somebody defined for you on your domain. So let me give you the following example. So let me try to move back to my slides. Um, and this is an example that you should, uh, you should do at home. No, no, no. Assume that you, you, you are, um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So assume that you are uh, uh, that you are a, a lifeguard. Um, this is the seashore. You're a lifeguard. This is where your tower is, and there is somebody that is drowning here at that point. Okay. Now running. This is send. So F is the refraction index. Exactly, and and this is C water. Okay, so here F is equal to two. So this is F equals to, I don't know, to, to, to two. And here F is equal to one. It means that running on the sand is much cheaper than running on the, uh, than uh, swimming in the water or rowing in the water. And the question is what would be the distance of uh, reaching this uh, poor guy uh, when you leave your, your, uh, your tower. And obviously what you would do in this case is compute uh, the distance and while you are looking at the distance from uh, and, and as long as you are uh, on the sand, it would be a set of concentric circles. But when you get into the water, what you'd get is a different way of looking at your propagating distance, which is nothing but the Huygens principle, which is nothing but the propagating waves from the source to the destination. And when you reach the destination, you know exactly how much time it, it would take you to get through the optimal path from the source to the destination. Now, what you need to do is find this path. So you'd go along the gradient direction. And what would happen is that you would probably go into this direction and then you'd get a different um, direction to the tower. So it would mean that you need to run as fast as you can to this point on the seashore or along the shore, and then start swimming from that point on. Okay, so this is where F comes into play. This is the way that I'm talking about. Okay, now, if I would uh, go back into my slides here, um, then what we see is that the same update scheme is telling me the following. Look at the I minus one and the I plus one points, choose the smallest one, look at the j minus one and j plus one points, look at the smaller one, and then use only the small values 
in order to determine the value at the ij point. Okay, now I have two indices because this is a two dimensional case. So now instead of just choosing one pointer at each side, I have four points. And from these four points, I can pick the smallest one and thereby uh, build my, you can think about it as, as building um, a roof. Okay, you have these two points at which you have the value. And then you pick the last one so that the gradient of this triangle is always equal to one or F if we are talking about the weighted problem. Now, wait, wait, wait. Now, what we are actually doing at the end of the day is solving this kind of quadratic equation uh, in order to, um, in order to uh, propagate my, uh, from the source point outwards. Um, this is how it looks like when you implement it in MATLAB. This is James Setian, uh, one of the guys that invented this on regular grids, then together we did it on non-regular grids. But now the jump to, uh, this is the example that I gave you at the beginning. And this is what you can do with that. Okay, you asked me what you can do with that first. So assume that now your image is your penalty and you're trying to extract these uh, veins in the picture of the retina. What you would do is you would click at this point as your starting point and then compute what you see here are the level sets uh, of, your, uh, of your distance function. And then you uh, click here and then it would the minimal path is in fact the minimal geodesic and it has a semantic meaning. You can also use it to compute shape from shading. In shape from shading, you know the gradient of the image at the absolute value of the gradient of the image at each and every point. And if you start from a point and you propagate outwards, then you can uh, compute the, uh, you can extract back the shape, the, the shape of the surface. So you can use fast marching where F now is some function of the image. You can do other stuff. You can uh, plot things in three dimensions. For example, you can think of X, Y as the position of a robot and theta as the rotation of the robot. And now the robot has infinite uh, regions and uh, regions which are equal to one. Okay, so now my F is binary in the sense that it is either infinite or one. And now you can actually compute your optimal path of navigating uh, a robot in this kind of complicated domain using a solver uh, of this kind, which is called a uh, fast marching solver. Why? Because this is how, uh, how it was named initially. Uh, you can go into higher dimensions, into four dimensions, but remember that at the end of the day, what you have here, and this is uh, a robot of one, two, three, four joints. So you have one, two, three, four um, angles that you can control. And the uh, idea is to navigate this robot from this initial position to that final position. Okay, and the yellow bars are actually obstacles that prevent this robot from moving freely. So doing an exhaustive, but very efficient exhaustive search in, in this domain, you can find the optimal path of this uh, arm that would navigate from this initial condition to this final condition. So it would be one, two, three, those, these are steps along the way. So this is about the penalty and about what you can do with that. Uh, and now what happens in, in triangulated domains? Uh, what happens with triangular domains is exactly the same. Now I want to be, uh, let me just move back to my slides um, because I feel more comfortable uh, writing. Can you see? Oh, it takes a little bit of time. Um, So again, you could, you could uh, do shape from shading. So this is the shape from shading problem. Okay, you have the gradient of the image, the gradient of the surface is equal to some function of the image. It was, uh, I think we talked about it. It was one minus the um, squared intensity. I mean, it was the cos, the sine divided by the cosine. And, and you can in fact uh, use that in order, use a fast marching solver in order to solve the shape from shading problem. Now, when we uh, dealt with graphs and i told you that uh, graph is a bad thing when you care about consistency uh, because what happens is that all information is going through these let's call them pipes okay uh, this graph could be embedded differently in 3d space in, in the embedding space it could be embedded like that and still the links between uh, point i point j and point k would be the same now in the fast marching method, 
everything goes exactly like the the extra algorithm. I mean, you propagate the information from the source point to the to the rest of the points in your domain in exactly the same manner. You you apply this uh, sorted heap idea in order to pick your points. The only difference is that when you land at point I, the update no longer looks at these two edges. And, and decides according to the value of the edges. It also considers the geometry, the angle, this theta angle between these two edges. If this concept is clear, then you may understand why we gained, using the same complexity, why we gained consistency. Consistency means that as you refine the grid, you would converge eventually to the continuous solution. Why we also uh, gain consistency when we have this, uh, this angle as an added uh, feature to the game. Okay, so right now we are propagating from a source point on a regular grid, but the whole idea could be also taken, and I've shown you that you can uh, navigate in three dimensions, four dimensions, etc., etc. Um, I will not get into how it works in in in, uh, in uh, complicated domains, but let me just tell you that the principle is the same. What do I mean? If you have now, let's look at a single triangle. Okay, this is triangle that. Uh, by which you can build a, a, a manifold. Okay, so if I have my curved manifold, two dimension manifold, I can use triangulation in order to describe it. Okay, but it doesn't have to be triangulation, but this is one way, one convenient way of looking at it. Now think of this triangulation as, what, as a single triangle for which this point and this, that point already have values. So this is, let's call it I, I, and this is T at point J, and I would like to update uh, the value of t at point k. What I need to do is think of this triangle as, as part of the plane where I have a t value and another t value. And I need to construct the value of the last one so that the triangle here should have a gradient which is equal to one. One or the cost function. Who was that? Yeah, yeah, the corona owner. The corona owner. Uh, Ashkara Corona? No, no, no. So add yourself a point. Okay. So what Ayal is saying is that uh, this, this is one. Okay. Now you land at a point, you look at its neighbors. Now, usually a point has more than one triangle. So it has another triangle as, as a neighboring triangle. And it has another one as a neighboring triangle. Let's pick up a different value, a different color. So it has a different one. So you need to visit all triangles that are about a point. And for each one, you need to compute the updated value. And then among all of them, you would pick up the one with the smallest value, okay? Which would be an analogy to what we had in the, in the, um, uh, in the flat, in the regular sampling domain. In the regular sampling domain, we had a really simple idea of how to pick them up. Now I can tell you there, there have been professors at Stanford and MIT, uh, at and MIT and James Etienne and at Stanford that were really troubled with the fact that you cannot run this uh, FMM method on curved domain, on triangular domains. But when you understand the geometry of what is going on uh, with the update scheme, extending it to higher dimensions with the same complexity is in fact not so complicated. I would say trivial, but um, there is a nice explanation of Feynman for what is trivial. He heard two mathematicians talking to one another and it took them about half an hour to explain embeddings into a, a complex manifold, et cetera, et cetera. And if somebody understands everything after half an hour, they call it trivial. So I would not say it is trivial in that sense, but it is, it is, it is not that complicated, okay? Okay, now there are many, many applications for that. Assume for a, for a moment that you could somehow uh, take a manifold. So I, I, I would draw a lot of hands in this course. So I have one manifold. Now think about just the skin. Okay, just, so this would be a glove, if you will. And, and there is another manifold. I now know how to write, how to do this, in this thing, something like that. Okay. Now, let me argue the following. If I know all distances between all points to all points, so I, I sample this point, this, this, this uh, shape, and it doesn't have to be uniformly, but it would be a dense, a nice looking sampling. And I would also sample that guy. Okay. And now some 
magician, I mean, now it could be you, would tell me what would be the distance between all points to all points. So you know what is the distance between these points and that, these points and these points and these points, et cetera, et cetera. So I know the minimal geodesics connecting, let's call this surface S and this would be surface Q, okay? So I have all the distances between uh, I and J in S and I have all the distances between I and J in Q. How could I say if this is the same surface, if this is the same glove? I mean, what would you do in order to uh, find out whether this is? The, the distance uh, preserved. I mean, if it's not stretched or something like that, it's only a shape. Uh, yeah, but there is huge, huge, huge problem here. What is the uh, big elephant or the huge problem of uh, saying if the two distances are the same? It's not a rigid transform between the... There, there is no rigid, rigid transform between the two uh, surfaces. Yeah, but this is the list of our problems. You don't need the rigid transform. I mean, you, you only need to look at the at this, at these. This is it. So yeah, so first of all, you answered my first question. The first question was to, to, to ask whether these two uh, surfaces are the same or not. So obviously there is no rigid transformation because they are embedded differently in R3. Okay, this is, this is embedded like that and the other one is embedded like that. So what you can look at is just the uh, inter, intergeodesic distances, which, which hopefully would not change much, okay? And if distances between points uh, were not, did not change much, we say that the two surfaces are isometric, okay? Usually we denote it like that. Which means that if, if, and this is a big if, if I know how this point is being mapped. Let me just pick a different color, purple again. So if I know how this point was mapped onto that and how that point was mapped onto that, then I need to know that these distances are preserved, okay? And if these distances are preserved for all matching points, then I know that S is isometric to Q. But, but, and this is a very important but, I don't have this transformation. Nobody is giving me this transformation. Usually this transformation is the unknown in all the games that we are playing. I mean, you scan the person and now you need to know, you need to, check, to know uh, which part is the nose and which part is the eye. And now you think to throw it into a deep learning mechanism, but then the question is how should the deep learning mechanism handle this kind of matrices? I mean, these are matrices. I, I know the distances between, uh, between each two points. How can I do, I mean, how can I deal with that? And for that, um, assume that all you did, uh, you learn is, is, is a classical statistical um, uh, analysis. Um, you're an EE graduate or an excellent um, CS graduate. And all you know is statistical analysis and you get these two distribution functions. I mean, let's call them by abuse of notation distribution uh, uh, matrices or autocorrelation matrices, okay? They will tell you how each point is far away from another point, okay? So in a sense, it is an, an, an autocorrelation matrix. How would you compare two autocorrelation matrices? What is the most naive way of, of comparing two autocorrelation matrices? Frobenius norm. Uh, Frobenius norm would have been great if you would have known what is the right order of, uh, of the vertices. This is, remember, the permutation of indices is the biggest problem. Is the one that you are trying to uh, to find out. Compare the spectrum. Who said that? Ido. Yeah. Okay, so Ido is going in the right direction. You need to compare the spectrum somehow. Of course, you need to con to to connect the dots in this course. Uh, Ido, you are almost at the yeah. yeah you you deserve a point. Let me show you what is going on. Um. Let's forget about it. Why not using uh, Wasserstein, uh, Wasserstein distance, something like that? Right. I mean, it's uh, you can call it if you if you if you if you consider it as an autocorrelation, then it's you can consider it as a distribution or something like that. You can consider it as a distribution, and we'll use a distance. In a moment, we'll pick the, the right distance. Wasserstein will come into play. Uh, Hausdorff would come into play. We'll add a Gromov to it. But in a, but but wait for a moment. Wait for a moment. So let's simplify the game. Let's assume that what I have are just points in some Euclidean space. Okay, I have the, the, 
the city in the cities in Israel. This is Haifa, this is Jerusalem, this is Tel Aviv, and uh, this is, I don't know, um, uh, um, um, Bet Shean, okay? Now, all I know is the distances between these cities. But I'm also telling you that the distances that the cities are given are, do belong to R2, okay? Assume that they do belong to R2, okay? Now, somebody is giving me only the distances between, between these cities. So it would give me only the distances between each and every cities. The question is how from the distances can I find an embedding into R2 that would relate to these kind of uh, up to symmetry, symmetries, rotations, and translations, okay? So is there an algorithm that would just take the distances between cities and, would, uh, and the distances are scalars? and extract back the, uh, the uh, embedding in R2. So there is a naive algorithm, obviously. Uh, take two points, put them on a line, take the third point, uh, use your cosine you know, that you could, and if things do not fall on one another, then you can basically do it in a, uh, in a greedy manner. But then when you do it in a greedy, greedy manner, what you'll have uh, is accumulation of errors. Uh, for that, what we'll do is we'll do something else. What we'll do is, first of all, uh, let me go back. First of all, let's, let's see how this D, uh, Dij looks like, okay? Dij equals to nothing but taking the coordinates of point I minus the coordinate of point J, okay? Okay, let's actually do it like that which is nothing but uh, the uh, absolute value of the coordinates of the first one plus the absolute value of the coordinate of the second one, okay, uh, minus uh, pi, uh, I'm allowed to do that, uh, pj, okay? Are you with me? This is just the definition of distances uh, in Euclidean spaces. You should agree with me. In R2, in Rn, it, it, this, is, this is how you define distances. Okay, uh, so p is basically the coordinates of this point. So somebody is giving me the coordinate of Haifa uh, and the coordinate of Bechean and the coordinate of uh, Tel Aviv and the coordinate of Jerusalem. Now what I will do is write the full matrix in the same manner. So it would be, um, it would be P1, P1. First row, the second row would P2. P2, etc., and you know the drill. Let's call this matrix Q. And here I will have Q transpose. And here what I would have is minus two P. So P would be a vector of uh, all my coordinates, P transpose times P, okay? So this is how uh, D square would look like, okay? So what is D? Let me write it uh, again. Uh, D, and a square here means that I, um, I square each and every element, okay? It would not be the square of the matrix, uh, of the matrix D. So, so let me write it, let me write it like that, D2, okay? Which is equal to Dij squared. This is how the indices of the matrix would look like, is equal to Q minus two P transpose P plus Q transpose. Now, if there would have been some magician that would have been, that would have allowed me to get rid of Q and Q transpose, if I would just have uh, P transpose P, how from P transpose P would I get the coordinates? This is something that you should know. Ronan asked you the same question last uh, lecture. You just have P, P transpose. How do you extract from P, P transpose P? Any ideas? You can take the square root of the uh, of the EVD. EVD? Uh, the composition of the regular uh, yeah. in value decomposition. EVD, but rather SVD. So yeah, the way to get from here to here is uh, using the SVD. Who was that? It's a point, so you should Uval. say who you are. You Uval, Uval Heitman. You Uval, so SVD. So in order to do that, what you get is SVD. SVD would give you uh, I can vectors, I can values, and I can vectors, one of them transposed, 
And basically the coordinates would be nothing but uh, the eigenvalues squared times the eigenvalues. Uh, sorry, the eigenvalues squared times the eigenvectors. Efrat, are you there? Yes, yes, why? <laughs> what happens uh, if the points were not extracted from uh, Euclidean space? Um, oh, I see. I mean, remember the we question. Have, we, would have, we would have a zero value. Um, remember the question, we'll get back yeah. to it. Don't, don't give me an answer yet, okay? Mm -hmm. But remember this question. Uh, bear this question in mind, it would, it would come back to us. So now the question is, okay, so there was a magician that was able to, uh, that was uh, allowing me to get rid of these cues, but how does this ma ma magician works? I mean, how can I get rid of these cues? And getting rid of these cues is nothing but, remember these cues have uh, rows and, and, and uh, that, are, uh, that include the same number and columns that include the same number. And the trick to get rid of, this, of such uh, matrices is nothing but multiplying by the Laplacian uh, click. I mean, you, can, you take identity and from identity, uh, you, do, you, multiply, you, you do one over n, uh, one, one transpose, which is a full matrix of ones. I mean, what you'd have here is identity minus one over n that multiplies a full matrix of ones. Okay, and this is called the Laplacian the Laplacian of a click or double centering matrix. And if you, let's, let's denote it as J, as capital J, okay? And if you apply this J to D on both sides, what happens is that this J completely eliminates the Qs. Why? Because remember Q has uh, all uh, the numbers along each row were equivalent and Q transpose the number at each column were equivalent. And what this guy is doing is subtracting the average of each row or each column. It depends if you multiply it from the right and from the left uh, from each element. So when you double center your matrix and you also multiply by one over uh, by minus one half, then what you'd get at the end of the day is nothing but P transpose P. Voila. So we took the interdistances matrix, okay? We doubled squared, okay? It was all the values were squared. We doubled centered it. And then what we get is the indices that we are looking for. And here, by going to the SVD, I'm getting back my coordinates. Now, if you look at the eigenvalues of this, uh, of this matrix, what you would have, if I would plot these eigenvalues from the largest to the smallest, if the points were initially taken from uh, a two-dimensional space, then the rank of this matrix would be full rank. Two, thank you, two. it would be two. The rest of them would be equal to zero. If this would have been a, a three-dimensional space, then I would get rank three. Uh, it would in, and it would always be positive because you need to be able to take the uh, the composition of this matrix in a legitimate way. But now assume that my DAJ is, is distances that I'm extracted not from the cities on a flat map, but rather from a curved domain. So the curve, the, the distances do not uh, describe anymore distances between, uh, between points in Euclidean space, but rather points between some curved domain. What happens now is that, and I have applied the same thing. I mean, I double center it and I'm looking at, at, at the result. The problem is that now I know that the, the problem was not uh, flat to begin with. And if the problem was not flat to begin with, then, the, 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 uh, my bug should pop up somewhere. And this somewhere is nothing but my eigenvalues here. So I would get my first eigenvalue, my second eigenvalue, which would be positive uh, which would be positive, obviously, and, and greater than zero. Okay, but at the point, I'm getting somewhere, uh, I have something that would actually get below zero. So I, had, I would have some value whose value would be uh, smaller than zero. 
And this value is something that I cannot take the square root of uh, if I would like to do some flat analysis to this problem. So taking uh, coordinates in flat domains, I can flatten a shape into, uh, into a flat domain. There is a very nice procedure to do that. But if my surface is curved, I can only hope to do something, but I can guarantee that there would always be an error. And yet, and yet, if you have, if you take many, many, and this was the uh, master, uh, this was the masters of Asielad who did the following. He took hands and and uh, legs. I don't know if this is the right way of uh, drawing a leg and giraffes. So you have a giraffe and dogs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what he did is he measured the distances, the inter-geodesic distances between each point to each point. And I show you, there is a way to do that. You can do the four FMM in order to populate your matrix and compute all the distances between all points to all points. Each, from each point, it would take you approximately N and between all points to all points, you can do it in N square. But let me give you a secret. Let me tell you a secret. You can actually do it in almost order of N because this matrix has low rank in some space. But don't listen to me until now. Just assume that you do it in the naive way and you've been able to compute the intergeodesics uh, of uh, shape S, okay? And you've been able to compute the intergeodesics of, point of, uh, of surface Q and you've been able to, uh, to do the giraffe, et cetera, et cetera. Now what he does is for each and every of the distances, he embeds them into R for example, three, okay? Or R4. But this is a two-dimensional manifold. This is a surface, it's a two-dimensional manifold. The fact that, that, that I allowed it to be embedded in R3 actually does something to this, uh, to this embedding. If, for example, I start with a hand like that and I force it to be embedded in R3, it basically tells me that I force all the distances that were going through the surface itself to be Euclidean distances. Okay, Ron, to be, um, yep. Small question. Um, practically speaking, um, is it correct to say that we can, we, we don't have to, uh, um, to compare two full, two full surfaces, but to just locally uh, catch few areas and, and say that the surfaces are locally isometric and use segmentation whole, in addition? The, 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 I mean, it says that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Let me tell you, if you know three corresponding points between two surfaces, you basically solve the problem. But it is often not the case. I mean, especially if these two surfaces are isometric. It's very, very, very difficult to say which finger is which. Um, or if you wear the glove in one way or the other, it would be really difficult. So again, Figuring out that these three points are the three are the, the same or the same corresponding three points on a different leg would basically solve the problem for you. Why? Because it, you can define with the three points coordinate system on one leg and then uh, expand it and show how you um, copy all the information from one leg to the other. But but there is a fundamental problem here. You don't know which point is which. And usually when you pick two points, I don't know the picky or uh, on the thumb or whatever, usually you would make a small mistake. And this small mistake could accumulate into a big mistake when you drift, when you go far away from these points. So yes, going for features and finding the features could do the job, uh, but let's do it in a more, how, to, how should I call it, in a more axiomatic way. Assume that nobody is giving you features and all you see is just the intergeodesic distances. So this is the name of the game right now, okay? And now let's do the first trick. Let's embed everything into R3, for example. And again, here I have a triangulation surface. And what, we'll, what I will have here is another triangulation surface. I mean, it would be the same triangles, but now embedded differently. The edges would, be, would have a different length. So the vertices would have the same identity, but the length of the edges would be different. What it forces me to do is basically uh, stretch all my uh, fingers so that they would be as far as possible for one another. And no matter how I started my uh, initial configuration of the hand width, at the end of the day, I would probably get something which is stretched out and has more or less the same geometry. So then you do it for the legs 
and you do it for the giraffes, et cetera, et cetera. And embedding these matrices by abusing my ability to, uh, to uh, measure the between them into the same Euclidean space allows me to now rigidly rotate and translate this object and say whether they are similar or not, okay? And in fact, this is a very simple classification problem. Uh, you can sample really then really uh, coarsely, uh, I mean, with relatively few points, these surfaces, and you can embed them into Euclidean domain. Obviously, there would be an error. There would be an embedding error. So you cannot really do it uh, very accurately, but you can do it uh, just for the sake of classifying objects. And then in this space, the classification of the objects and knowing which object is which can be done uh, without, without caring about the isometries. I mean, without caring about the fact that when I uh, pose myself differently in, in 3D space, the intrinsic geometry is more or less preserved because I cannot really stretch or tear my, uh, my geometry a lot. And this, this holds for almost all creatures in nature, okay? So in some oh. sense, on you're choosing a canonical embedding, and then uh, you compare them by simple uh, rotations and translations to see if it's the same uh, surface, yes? Exactly, Boz. So what Boz is saying is that just, I mean, by the way, you get here for free. I told you that there are these eigenvalues here and eigenfunctions. These eigenvalues are nothing but the second order moments of the object. So if I would just match the second order, I mean, the double centering, nobody asked me that, but you also have to hit, uh, sorry. You also have to apply these double, these double centering matrices to these P's. And what these double centering matrices are doing to this P's is basically subtracting from all the X's, the average of the X's, and from all the Y's, the average of the Y's, etc. So it would put all the points in the center of mass. These eigenvalues would be nothing but the second order moments of this object. So in a sense, if I'm looking at this space as the canonical space, then the second order moments would be nothing but the second order moments of, so in fact, I can just look at the, eigen, uh, at the eigenvalues and compare between them and then just, and this would be a good enough way of, a pro, of a comparing between these objects. Uh, obviously uh, you need to sample uniformly and all the nice properties of, uh, of moments, but, but beyond that, it's, uh, it's a doable thing. By the way, it's a very bad thing. I mean, this is what we started uh, with uh, many, many years ago, and now we can do much better in a moment. I will show you how. Okay, so I have this uh, inter-distances matrix, and I told you that this is how the deal looks like. It's not really important. And at the end of the day, uh, when attacking my Q matrix with the double center matrix, it would basically eliminate these Qs, and we end up with these guys. And at the end of the day, what we do is basically SVD, that by which I extract my uh, coordinates, okay? And these coordinates would be up to uh, rotation, translation, and reflections, okay, uh, of, of the coordinates. And I do it by simple SVD. And here you can guarantee that the, the error is distributed uniform. Okay. Uh, what is the error that I'm now, assume that I have done my trick and I'm looking at the eigenvalues and the eigenvalues look like that and then they would be small like that. Then I can assume that my object can be embedded into, in this case, R3. But the fact that I have uh, dismissed, that I have deleted all these errors in, is in fact something that I need to account for. I need to know what is my optimization doing at the end of the day. And the, the, uh, the optimization, uh, the, the embedding that I got, uh, minimizes this strange looking errors. This strange looking error is nothing but subtracting from the eigenvalues of the, uh, of the original, uh, the composition of the distance function, the small ones that we are using. So basically what I would do is accumulate uh, these lambda, assume that I stopped here after three, so it would be lambda four, lambda five, lambda six, etc. okay? So this is, would be just the accumulating the second order moments of the object. And the reason I'm calling it a second order moment is because if, if I would uh, write my coordinates of the, of the points as uh, P, K, I, and sum over K, okay? So you can write, you can show that uh, this would be nothing but the inner product 
between um, uh, uh, between all the let me just see what is going on here all the ith coordinates uh, dot producted with itself and at the end of the day what I would get is is uh, the, the fact that the, the two uh, eigen uh, vectors are orthogonal I would get one here and at the end of the day what I would get is nothing but the definition of the second order moment okay so this is called the second order moment okay um okay now i'm now exactly at a position where i'm i'm uh, let, let me just stretch two more minutes so let us now try to redefine uh the problem um tabula rasa okay i'm just going into the uh i'm given an interdistances matrix and i would like to embed them in rm uh, such that the unknowns, the argument would be my points, okay? So this is my minimization problem, okay? And the, 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 what I know is that I can compute the distances in Euclidean fashion analytically, okay? So multidimensional scaling or MDS is a family of methods where you can compute distances analytically. Okay? So when you have an analytic solution to the points in the target space, uh, this is called multidimensional scaling. And this one is called least square scaling. I mean, you can optimize for the uh, coordinates uh, with a method which is called Smakov. We'll not cover it in this course. Uh, or for example, assume that your, uh, let's move on. Assume that your points, for example, are given on some sphere. Then we go back into the original problem, which is called classical scaling. So classical scaling is when you apply SVD. So if they are given on a sphere, then the distance is nothing but the section of the sphere. So what you know is that the distance between two points is nothing but the cosine of the angle between, uh, between the two vectors, okay? So if the cosine of the vector squared is given, what you need to do is nothing but SVD uh, to D tilde, where D tilde is nothing but the cosine uh, of your entries to the matrix, okay? So, you take the cosine of all points, um, and, and this is how you would get back, extract back the coordinates. So there is a way of extracting back the coordinates also uh, when you are uh, embedded on a sphere. Um, and this is a good, uh, a good point to stop because uh, what we'll do in the next lecture is um, uh, use the Hausdorff transform in order to comment about what is known as iterative closest point. We will not talk about least square scaling and Hausdorff, um, can we embed non-flat domains into infinite dimensional spaces? Here, the answer is luckily yes. I will not talk about the Nash inequality and Nash, sorry, not, not Nash inequality, Nash, Nash embedding theorem, which also deals with uh, similar uh, problems. So this is as close as you will get to Nash embedding theorem in, 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 your, uh, um, in your studies, probably. Um, Next, what we'll do is we'll replace the analytic way of computing distances with numerical ones. And then we'll call it GMDS, okay? Generalized multidimensional scaling. And then what we'll do, we'll move into the spectral domain and we'll call it SGMDS. And since it, it begins, GMDS, and since it, it begins to look like Nananachman Mouman, I will stop here. And unless you have any questions, uh, I will let you relax for a little bit, a little bit, and then move to um, to Ido's uh, recitation. If not, then uh, we'll meet again next week. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ido. You can stop the. Uh,